So uh, let's see if we can pull this one off uh, effectively. So this is a fun topic, um, I think, uh, to come to a search-centric conference and talk about something other than search. Um, but I think what's interesting about the panel that we brought together today is that a lot of these people have been in the search industry for a long time, and they're trying to figure out how to get from search to social, from search to Facebook, talk to their customers about getting from search to social. If there's even a bridge between the two, figure that out or not. Um, and we're going to cover a lot of those topics today. Uh, probably not with the same zest as Marty, but with maybe the same efficiency. Uh, I'll try to have our panel uh, move very quickly through a bunch of different topics. I actually think there's a very uh, large breadth of things that we can talk about today. So um, I'll have everybody introduce themselves, including myself, uh, Neil Robertson from Trada, and we are a crowdsourced paid search solution for mid-market customers. We also uh, focus on Facebook advertising, mostly around fan acquisition. Uh, I'm Jonathan Cho. I'm Managing Director and Head of Search for Mindshare. I'm Heather Molina. I work for Resolution Media, leading the PhD agency team. I'm Nate Riggs, Director of Social Business for the Karcher Group, a search firm in Canton, Ohio. Uh, Fred Teets, uh, VP and GM of Extol. Essentially what we do is consumer-to-consumer -consumer marketing platform that turns customers into advocates to drive everything from engagements and shares to sales. Okay, question number one. Uh, by show of hands, has anybody achieved a comparable CPA on Facebook as they have on search for any product in, from an advertising perspective? Okay, that's a no. So, <laughs> actually, I'm interested in the audience. Has anybody achieved a comparable CPA on Facebook? Interesting. Using purely advertising, right? Okay. Um, not including fans. Okay, two. All right. Um, that's not a very uncommon, uh, um, uncommon thing. I think a lot of what Facebook is very interested in now is trying to figure out how to change that dynamic a bit uh, as they get further and further into uh, their content strategy. So given that, when you talk to your longstanding search customers about budgets, deployments, investments in Facebook, how do you talk to them about, I, I'm going to say Facebook a lot, but I'm going to imply Google Plus and Twitter, but so much of the dollars are moving to Facebook, I think it's maybe a good catch-all. Um, so excuse me for that. How do you talk to them about what to invest in? Are they investing in brand? Are they investing in fan acquisition? So Heather, how do you think about it? Well, for us at PhD, we're seeing, and at Resolution Media overall, we're seeing it across the board in a variety of different areas. I think depending on uh, whether it's a direct client or one of the agency clients, how we go about determining the investment for a particular client is um, going to be um, more of an integrated solution or a connected solution depending on the agency partner that we're working with, whether it be OMD or PhD. So when we work with one of the bigger agencies, we do have to take into consideration all the other objectives for the client. Um, now in terms of determining, you know, how it should be, oh, sorry, go ahead. So does that mean you can sort of get away without having any metrics? Um, right? to, I mean. to some degree, it has to be an integrated metric with whatever that agency is, the overall objective is for that particular client. I know that at least within PhD, we have a very knowledgeable investment team, which I sort of sit on, but I don't lead, and we get together and work on, okay, in terms of the overall media mix and all the channels that we're looking at from a digital perspective, how how are we going to parse out this budget to really drive all of this wonderful uh, connected um, storytelling that we're doing on behalf of the client, all this buying that we're doing, making sure that everything's connected and that part of that is, you know, going back to, hearkening back to yesterday with the attribution piece and really finding that right mix. So we're totally stuck in attribution limbo <laughs> right now, basically, with Facebook. So, yeah. Nate, what about yourselves, your customers? You know, I think it, I bring a different perspective in that most of our customers in the middle market and even sometimes enterprise, particularly in, in like manufacturing, um, simply haven't invested in building the channel out on Facebook. So kind of the first step of the game is really looking at like advertising campaigns to try to drive likes to that page to build that affinity score so that we can do things with the organic aspect of Facebook and content sharing down the road. Another Another thing to consider too is with Facebook's new advertising areas in terms of like reach generator, if, if you don't have enough fans that like your page, reach generator is just simply not going to be effective for you. So um, how many people here, and this is a little bit of a biased perspective from where, sort of how I take a look at Facebook, how many people here think of a like basically as an email address? The, the reason Maybe I not that, even. Yeah, what's that? Okay. Maybe not even. Um, so, um, if you don't think of it like, a, like an email address, then what do you think of it like? 
Well, when we talk to customers about what we do, uh, a lot of our discussion goes on getting beyond the like. The like, they've invested you know, millions of dollars in creating these pages, fan pages, generating likes, and now they're wondering how do they connect the dot back to their business yeah. KPIs, which is conversion, yeah. sales, customer acquisition, and so forth. And I was just in a meeting yesterday with a, a major enterprise client and talking with the head of digital, head of social, and head of e-commerce, and they're trying to connect the dots. Uh, they know they need to build likes and get the traffic and build their brand timelines and get people engaged there. But now the next question is, how do you then use that to get sponsored stories? And then how do you tie back to their big investment, which is their website and their e-commerce and traffic, stuff like that? So, but this is a little bit of my point, right? So if you've acquired a like and then you start running a content drip campaign on it, very similar to an email address, hoping to get a conversion at the end, isn't it just like an email address with an amplification mechanism built in? Uh, see, I disagree with that. I think the, the difference between an email address is, is if you've subscribed to an email newsletter, you've said, I'm going to receive all of the updates that you send out. You may not read them, you may just delete them from your inbox, but that's a direct subscribe. A like is more of an intent to subscribe. It's the first, it's the first aspect of edge rank. So I'm going to show my affinity for this brand, but unless I somehow interact on that page, I may not ever see any content that comes out of that page. And I think if you're just focusing on the like, I think it very much is an email, right? I mean, it really is going beyond that, getting people to create content, to share, to go really beyond the like. Because if you are focusing on that, you're right. It isn't very much uh, aligned with the email piece of it. So I think it's really how brands, to, to his point earlier, it's how you go beyond that and really making sure that you're having people create content for you, share it with it, and really going into that social element and not just being kind of a, a different form of email. Um, I'll say one thing, if it's comforting to anybody, uh, I was at uh, the Facebook Developer Conference uh, uh, last week and they had a presentation on ROI, which we were all very excited to listen to, and the end of the presentation they said, and we need you to figure it out for us. Um, I thought it was a really interesting way to um, convince the audience there was ROI on Facebook. Uh, this is a true story. Um, so, you know, what... Um, so I think you know one of the questions then is okay. So you can kind of change the change the like into different things depending on your content strategy. This is getting a little bit back to the last panel. There seems to be a thousand flowers blooming of con of uh, tool providers in the Facebook ecosystem. Um, how many of them have you seen? <laughs> right? Um, what's the acceleration rate of them? And do you think that the better strategy is wait it out, and let them die off? Uh, play with a bunch of them, wait for the big players, the platform players, some of which are here to integrate these pieces. H how do you approach the, the sort of a coming apocalypse of you know, Facebook platform or, or social media platform um, providers? I don't think you can wait. Honestly, I think um, there are a lot of companies out there making a lot of money right now for companies that are waiting or taking the easy route. Um, I think you know, when you think about clients and companies that come to you and they just have a, a like goal and they have nothing really beyond that, it's very simple then to kind of buy, kind of, um, you know, uh, create some sort of CPL uh, arrangement with a provider, a managed service provider, and then easily back into that. Uh, the problem is there's not a lot of thought into that and how you got to that, and sometimes there isn't that transparency as to what the margins are there. And really, as search marketers, that kind of irks you because, you know, I mean, if you think back to the old days of search, on, you know, sometimes, sometimes how you would provide service for search was not totally transparent. And, you know, um, you know I, I think as search marketers, we need to be smarter than that. We need to really challenge our technology providers from a managed service, moving from a managed service to a self-serve, um, and seeing how that can integrate with the other things that you have going on. Yeah, and I, I agree with John. Yeah, it, Jonathan, it's it's definitely been something that's top of mind with us because there are literally literally a, a ton of new <laughs> a ton of new vendors out there every freaking week, and so we are constantly meeting with them and determining and you know taking a tour and walking through what they actually provide and what they offer. And some they come to the table and it's just like this is you know to be honest it's a bit of a joke some of the things that they're offering. And then you have others that are that are uh, Facebook provide or you know. Um, what is it? Uh, the Facebook. Um, oh, yeah. EMTs. Yeah, and 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 they have these really wonderful, you know, wonderful products to bring to the table, and and you know, it all goes back to again the data that you receive from it. You know, likes. If, if a vendor comes to me and the only option they have is like, that ain't gonna cut it for my clients. The type of clients that we're working with, uh, they're being challenged or starting to be challenged with the ROI question, and in terms of trying to figure out how we balance or how we start to approach determining that. Right now, we've been in a very nice state where you know clients know they want to get on Facebook. They know they want to be there. It's a sexy place to be, or they want to be on Twitter, um, but they haven't been 
as hard pressed to really push us on the ROI stuff until more recently. And maybe that's just because of everything that Facebook has going on in its own world. They're now wanting to see exactly what they're pumping all these dollars into, you know, that this company that's going to be going public and how it's going to actually help them with their business initiatives. They want more clarity. So um, isn't one of the really tricky things about trying to make progress, a progression from search to any kind of social, let, let's take again, you know, Facebook or, or anywhere else that you can get demographic information, is that uh, you now actually have a lot more information. <laughs> um, you know, we've been relatively blind in search for 10 years when we were just, the last panel was talking about bounce rates and we all know conversion rates. It's a pretty pathetic insight into what, you know, the traffic that we're sending, right? I mean, you can do, you know, geo stuff, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's ways you can slice and dice a little bit. But, I mean, the reality is you can get extremely micro-targeted on Facebook now, and the customers are getting very smart very quickly saying, okay, well, you know, all of our customers want extensive demographic analysis, want, you know, um, uh, as many sort of likes and interest analysis as possible. And I'm fearful that they're going to start asking the same questions in search, right? That they're going to start to say, well, you're just pushing traffic at me and giving me one final number. That doesn't seem very smart. How do I get smarter about this? So have you guys seen that? Have you thought about that? Are you scared of that? How, how does essentially demographic visibility that's coming out of Facebook advertising or other types of display advertising um, drive back into the search world and have to make us a heck of a lot smarter? Well, I think they both have to drive each other. I mean, a lot of ways, right? I mean, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the reason that I think we're pressing these technology uh, providers and these these managed partner services to uh, to be smarter and be better with the, the investment is because I think a lot of people that are owning those relationships are search marketers <clears throat> that come from a very specific type of perspective on what their expectations are when it comes to uh, putting in that rigor and and that level of uh, maintenance and care uh, in, in in providing the best service and looking at the data. Um, and even though I agree, it, it you know the it's a very unique kind of. Uh, way that you optimize and, and, and do uh, and use this technology than it is from search. But what we've seen anyway is that that, that that transition hasn't been so hard as opposed to someone that is, you know, set on just establishing a CPL and saying, okay, run with it, give me a fancy report at the end of the campaign and I'll pass that along. Search markers, again, want a little bit more than that. And I think that's why they're making kind of an easier transition to that. Yeah, and I think by nature, just search marketers, you know, this being a search conference and all, we tend to be more into the data and that really excites us and gets us off and everything. So seeing these vendors come to the table that have these more robust offerings and a lot of detail and information, those are the people that we want to be interacting and playing with. We don't really give a crap about the people who just do likes. I mean, it's great, it's wonderful, and it's a nice idea and stuff, but the reality is we need more than that. We need much more than that, especially because we can't provide our clients with that ROI, um, that ROI perspective just yet. And it's funny, a lot of these providers now are coming and saying, we're search guys too. I mean, that's part of their line yeah. now, because they know that that's what we're looking for. You know, that we don't want this kind of salesman that has never really done or no search. Yeah. They know that there's that correlation. So uh, it literally is like the first line that comes out of mouth. Yeah, sell us with people. data options. Don't sell us with yeah. pretty reports and likes. Okay. Anything to add? You know, I almost want to challenge that for a second because you can get down and you can look at object performance, especially on the organic side. And I think we as search marketers tend to get so caught up in the advertising aspect of it, but we never think about the actual content production part of it. So you can look at individual metrics for object performance and you can optimize ads based on that. But again, how do you get to any of that if you haven't effectively built a fan base and measured whether or not that fan base is moving in the right direction among the target audience that you want in the right geographic areas? Consider like if you're a multi unit unit business, you know, a restaurant chain that has hundreds of locations spread across the country. How are you measuring where those likes are coming from and are you building that fan base within the right areas of people who could actually someday come into your restaurant and, and pay a bill? I, th I think this is a fundamental question that keeps coming up uh, when I talk to people about social, especially around, you know, Facebook. It's, it's the question of, is it the right thing to do to put really great decorations at the party and have the right music playing and then try to invite as many people as possible? Or the right thing to do is to invite a few really interesting people to your party and then figure out as you go what the right music to play is and what decorations you should hang. And I think there's really diffuse strategies going on right now. I, Facebook is very much taking the content first strategy. That's, they've said that over and over again, that they want you to start building the page, the page of the center of everything. And they want you to invite your you know, 150 friends from your, um, you know, from your address book and kind of get the conversation going that way. We actually see our customers coming the complete opposite way, saying we need to, you know, our, our uh, competitors have 200,000 fans and we have 15,000 fans and we need 40,000 of them 
you know, in the next in the next two weeks before we have this event. And don't worry, we'll start posting some pictures, right, to keep people engaged. I, I'm interested if you guys have a philosophy of, you know, which side, chicken or egg? I mean, I think it depends on client. I think it really you need to go, you know, you have to go back and you can't, and, you know, and you're right, you know, the, there is a, a flaw in, in search people taking things on. It's very different. Yeah. I mean, the way that you establish a long-term successful uh, Facebook campaign is very different than search because search doesn't necessarily change as dynamically as, as this has a whole evolution, right? I mean, it's the acquisition and then it's maintaining, keeping them kind of engaged and sharing um, and going beyond that. Uh, so I think aligning that, but also with the creation of the content and the life, the lifespan of that, the frequency of that, it, it, it's completely different than I think in search in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, and I, I agree with that. And I think going back to Nate's point about, you know, taking a deeper look at the kind of data and, uh, you know, fan base that you're building on Facebook and allowing that to drive the content. I mean, from a search perspective, you know, I always think of search as being that that nucleus with inside the atom or, or SEO in particular, and then, you know, the social and then the paid search and then the display and everything else on top of it. You know, we're really in that, especially with SEO, you need to have, making you have, need to be making sure that you're leveraging all the information you can from these areas to start building that specific content out. And again, not building just broad content out, but yes, digging in a little bit deeper and looking at the demographics and saying, this is how I'm going to speak to this audience. Here's where it goes appropriately within my, you know, my, my whole plethora of assets that I have available of what I'm building out and stuff. And I know that because I used to work for I work with Chris at Group M, and, and now that I'm at Omnicom, um, you know, I can say that both holding companies or both agencies definitely have been approaching it as content marketing or content solutions rather than just SEO, paid search. It's really just a whole gamut in terms of how we're looking at uh, acquisition and speaking to the audience and making sure we're building the right things for, for the user. Um, I think there's uh, more to it than just Facebook. You know, one thing that our company, we're a PMD also with Facebook, and our VP of product was up there and heard the same thing, like, okay, guys, go figure it out for us so we can make money. Uh, it's about the multi-channel. Uh, we're a platform that we provide to people like yourself and the clients, and in our discussions, we're getting them to leverage things that they have besides Facebook. And I think this open graph and the permissions that you're gonna get there and sponsored stories will help unlock the value because you'll be able to get beyond just a like. You can claim, you can want, you can buy. So you're gonna have a lot more verbs that are coming to play that marketers can use on Facebook. And I think what'll happen is you'll be able to really then identify and track and follow your advocates and then really identify the value that they bring back to you as a brand. In Facebook, with sponsored stories, of course, is immediate ROI. You can get there by driving sponsored stories there, but also back to your website, because you can integrate that back to the website and claim on Facebook, get the permissions, get the data, and then identify and track them. I think that'll drive a lot of value. So to go a little bit deeper on that, because I think um, what you're talking about is fundamental to the ROI story. How many people here know what action spec is? Okay, that's zero. So. Um, Action spec is the underlying mechanism by which Facebook is enabling you to create custom actions on Facebook. So we're all familiar with like, you've seen Listen on Spotify. That was a very custom implementation of action spec. At the conference last week, Facebook just announced literally that you can create your own custom actions for any story that you want. Review, I bought, I love, I hate, you know, anything that you want and that your uh, fans can actually share that out. What's important about that is you can then advertise directly to those um, customers or uh, users that have had a verb. So for example, I could advertise only to people that say, I want a pair of Nike shoes, right? So the reason I keep going back to this you know, like as an email analogy is because I, <laughs> um, I like it, but also because I really view a lot of social as essentially a funnel. And, and what Facebook, and will be, I'm sure, followed by others, is allowing everybody to do now is essentially tag each step of the funnel and allow you to change your content. So they also hinted at the fact that you would be able to target any piece of content on your Facebook page to any specific action. So only target this piece of content to people that have reviewed my shoes. You can see the whole thing on the timeline, but it sounds a lot like... Um, email marketing to me, so I'm gonna just keep saying it. So, um, but so this is a, I think this is a really important thing to understand that that's coming and it's coming very very quickly. And sort of like Marty said, there's a six to nine month window of being very ahead of the curve here and taking taking advantage of this in a in a way before sort of it gets very very diffuse. So, um, have any of you actually run any campaigns using either action spec or you know basic uh, basic actions? 
You have. Uh, we're in beta right now with some customers where they're actually uh, claim on Facebook from their website, run it into sponsored stories and stuff like that. So we've been playing around with some of this open graph permission stuff and then driving that for the marketer down into sponsored stories. Uh, we're probably a couple months out before it's shaked and baked and you know ready for prime time. But the results are, are pretty good so far in terms of the, uh, the blow through that we call it in terms of people signing up and then you're getting, you know, scraping the information from their friends and be able to put them into their timelines and so forth. So it's very interesting. Uh, we think the click through rate is a lot higher though. We're seeing 20, 30 percent above what they were getting with the regular Facebook ads. No surprise really there, I guess. Yeah. Is the slippery slip on that that you have almost too many options? And right now everyone's like, the value of a like. Well, what's the value of anything you can create? Then how do you define that for clients and show that there is a value in that? I think certainly click-through rate and understanding, you know, um, how, you're, how you're paying for the ad is, is a big part of it and a piece of the optimization. Uh, but beyond that, you know, when you have just too much, too many controls and things to pull and, uh, and change, does that complicate things for yourself and also for your clients? And how do you kind of get in front of that. I mean, that's, that's, that's I think, uh, something that we're all going to encounter in the next six months and something that we need to get intelligent about, uh, but also making sure that we're keeping clients ahead of the curve. Because um, right now, from what I'm seeing anyways, clients are still in that mindset of just likes. I don't know what it means to me, yeah. but I think a million likes sounds great for this, this launch. And I mean, I, you know, that conversation still happens and we need to take them back down to kind of step one uh, before we can really jump to the other things. But I, I agree, I think we need to, press on beyond that because we ourselves can't really find the true value of that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's a constant, as we were talking the other day, it's definitely a constant education in this space, um, you know, in terms of living and breathing it and seeing how things evolve and change. And things seem to be evolving a little more uh, robustly and quickly in the social side than it does on the search side. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I think that's one of the reasons why search people tend to be uh, ideal, the ideal uh, the ideal fit for in terms of managing this social aspect. But yeah, it's a con as Jonathan said, it's a constant education of the clients and refiguring and retooling exactly what the objective should be of the campaign. Yeah, I think um, for those of you that haven't jumped into the fast moving stream of social yet, one of the hardest things from an organizational perspective or product perspective is simply just keeping up. I think in the space of three weeks, uh, a couple months ago, Facebook announced uh, three new ad units and they were supported not by everybody, for everybody, in the API, out of the API. It's a, it's a knife fight every day, just trying to play, you know, trying to dance with, uh, dance with them. It's very interesting what they're doing. Um, just for those that don't know the, the terminology, there's so much terminology, a claim is a new um, action inside of Facebook that actually is centered around a daily deal or a coupon. So you can actually create a coupon for your customer and then the, the, the user on Facebook claims it, and all that means is they like it, which goes into their stream, thus amplifying it, but it doesn't mean they're actually purchasing it. So Facebook's getting super tricky about creating like all these like micro activities around everything other than the consummation of the deal. I mean, there's like 45 things you can do around everything but not buying the shoes, right? Looked at, went into the store to check it out, threw one at my friend, I mean, it's like, it's, it's amazing what you can kind of create other than the final consummation of the transaction. So um, that's really where they're headed because what they want you to do is to sort of discretize every single piece of the process in a commerce or any kind of a consummation transaction and have every single piece of it shared with your friends and let them amplify essentially the whole buying process. Um, so, okay, I've talked about Facebook a lot. Does anybody care about anything other than Facebook? So, I mean, and I mean that in, from a scale perspective, right? So, not that there's not interesting things out there. Let me just ask the audience, because I know everybody hates audience asking questions. Um, has anybody run a Twitter promoted tweets campaign? Okay, well, that's actually more than I thought. Has anybody had any kind of ROI success running a Twitter promoted tweets campaign? Okay, 20%, a little bit less. Has anybody run LinkedIn campaigns? Okay, that's interesting. Um, how do you guys talk to your customers, uh, and try not to say it depends on the client, right, about um, the different social media channels, um, and, and maybe the answer is it does depend on the client, but um, is there really that much value in doing anything other than sort of test, when you're a first time testing the waters client of trying things on Facebook just from a scale perspective? So, I mean, we love to test things, um, but I think that it's that issue that you can't scale it. You can't, I mean, you know, when clients, uh, especially some, some of the clients that we work with, 
um, uh, that size, it's such a drop in the bucket and it's such a small uh, mover of, of what they feel is successful, uh, it's hard to get their attention for things like that. But we still do it anyway, and we challenge ourselves to learn more about it and see what the opportunities are. Uh, but at the end of the day, it just doesn't have the scale of a Facebook that it's just so difficult it's and it's so case. niche, some things, especially yeah. like the LinkedIn, um, which has some pretty neat ideas, I think, uh, if you're a smart and savvy advertiser uh, and wanted to you know, target very specific things with a very specific type of product, it could be very useful for you. But uh, again, th it does, it's not for everyone. Uh, where Facebook, I think, in, in, in some ways can apply to just about everyone. Yeah, I would say that, you know, again, going back to scale, Facebook is sort of the more universal of the social media. We do have some clients who are on Twitter, and again, I know you hate to, you hate to hear this, it does kind of, you know, depend on the client. We have some clients like HBO, where we are doing Twitter, or Starbucks, where we are doing Twitter, and it makes sense. Um, but there are other clients that we have that are much bigger, you know, say a pharmaceutical client, where, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to really show. And again, when we're looking at the overall digital budget and investment that we're getting from the client, and we're trying to figure out what is the best approach, you know, a lot of times, you know, anything outside of Facebook and the and the search engines, we have we, we get a small budget to test and play with and to try to prove that it's worthwhile of a heavier investment. Um, but it can be, you know, it can be challenging depending on the type of client. So, so uh, I'll ask you this uh, question. So I think it's uh, a very different thing playing with a very large customer like an HBO or someone who can get acquire millions of fans. I've seen this sort of small data problem on social networks as much as there's a small data problem in terms of optimization and just traditional search. You know, a small $3,000 a month budget, you know, getting not that many clicks on that many keywords doesn't tell you much. 2,000 fans to do targeting to action spec on is almost going to be a complete waste of time. So how do you grapple with the small data problem in social, maybe not just on Facebook, but you know, in LinkedIn, there's how much volume can you get off of any kind of ad targeting you're doing on Twitter, those kinds of things. You know, have you dealt with any sort of small, medium-sized customers? Uh, yeah, we do a lot of SMB, and what we really push is a multi-channel approach. And when you look at the data that we get back, when you look at the shares and amplification, Facebook and Twitter significantly higher. Right, But when you look at conversion to business KPIs, it's their website and their email that has the higher conversion. So I think what you were mentioning, when you get to the open graph and everything's going on, we're going to connect those two dots eventually, I think. But right now, especially for the SMB guys, that you know they're spending a couple thousand dollars a month and they're doing email, dedicated email, drip emails, Twitter posts, Facebook on their promotion on their pages and so forth, you'll get 5x clicks and sh post on Facebook, but you'll get 4x the conversions from their email, for example. So, so how do you, I mean, how, from a business perspective, how do you scale that? I mean, the, the big difference, you know, a big difference between search and any, everything we're talking about here is that we're, we're moving to a very content and a very visual world, right? I mean, search retargeting is visual, everything on Facebook, you know, and visual, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest is a visual medium. Um, way more, way more expensive, way more subjective. Uh, a lot harder to do, a lot more expensive to do. Uh, you know, you can A/B test 300 text ads on AdWords all day long. You know, how do you do the same you know, A/B test? You're create creative, and then A/B testing. I'm just interested from a business perspective. The, you know, we the, our approach at Trotta is we have to create a crowd um, that get paid based on performance. So we sort of like ducked out the. The, you know, the uh, escape hatch on that one um, just happens to be our, our, our model. But how does a traditional company deal with this issue where you now need a graphic designer sitting next to every project? At $2,000 a month, that cuts margins very hard, I imagine. Right? Or do you charge the client? I mean, what it are the is. Different what, what we do is we have different tiers of pricing where uh, you do the creative, we do the creative, full managed services so we can execute everything. And the key thing is the optimization. But you're right. Then you get into A-B testing, creative testing, and so forth. And you got to let the data drive that. And the, the trick is we have seen that when you optimize over time, six to 12 months, you will see an increase in your ROI based on your metrics of like conversions and customer acquisition and so forth. So it sort of, I think over time, flattens out and pays for itself. But you're right, you were talking earlier about education. It's hard to get the client to get their head around that up front to then commit to that process. And then, oh, I can't test it in 30 days and get the data. Well, not really. That's not gonna happen. You're not gonna see much. 
You know, I think too, going back to your, your comments about small businesses and even middle market, a lot of times anything social is a means to an end. So, you know, if you have a, a B2B client that wants to increase search rankings, then something like Google Plus and sharing content there may make sense for them. Um, a lot of times if, if the email list is performing, then what social channels can we use to drive new uh, signups to that email list where we know that there's going to be a proven ROI already. Um, but to that point too, a lot of times that's a 12 to 18 month battle before you can get to the point where you're starting to show effective dollars and cents on the bottom line. From, a, from an agency perspective, I mean, you guys have a lot of resources, but how are your teams changing just by the nature of the, you know, the content that goes along with the campaign? Well, for us, I mean, you know, a lot of the focus has been on building out and finding uh, resources that can service, you know, the creation, the content creation copywriters, um, you know, working with people, you know, developing those skills in-house, um, you know, for a long time or for quite a while. We did outsource that kind of stuff, and I think that there are a multitude of vendors that can provide that create from a creation standpoint, um, you know, providing us that kind of content that we need to tap into for clients and stuff. But as an agency, we are we are starting to look in house or building more robustly and greatly those services in house to meet those needs um, rather than. And then in terms of pricing, um, you know, it's being priced into our product and our offering and what we're servicing the client with because clients are coming to us with the expectation of, you know, why do I have to, you know. I, I hired you to do this for me or to manage this for me. Why do you not have those resources in-house already? So a lot of the types of clients that we're dealing with, you know, they expect us to be able to be a one-stop solution and provide that stuff, not just necessarily outsource it to an external vendor. And I think it's part of the evolution, right? Um, uh, once the business justifies it, to be able to support that and get that kind of expertise in-house. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I kind of related to like paid search um, where, you know, uh, there are some situations where clients actually require you to speak with uh, creative agencies to approve the, the, the wording or the messaging, yeah. which might be completely mind-boggling to some of uh, the, you know, the advertisers in this room and is, is me as well for a number of my clients, uh, where we give that, we are given that authority to do that. Yeah. But I think that was part of the evolution. Yep. And, and I think in the same exact way, that's kind yeah. of how we're adapting. Yeah, no, and I think that we're finding that we're sort of the key holders in terms of the strategy of what they're building from a content perspective because we have that access to that data, we understand user behavior, we're able to guide the creative agencies down the path of what actually needs to be getting built. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is we take for granted in the search world, there's a huge amount of uh, tools and technologies to help us research before we launch campaigns. Um, you know, there's you know, uh, keyword tools, you know, the Xenia, there's uh, all sorts of other things that are out there that, you know, Google and others provide. One thing that I've noticed in social is that there's essentially nothing to do research beforehand on. You're throwing a lot of stuff, I mean, even just, you know, if anybody here has tried to actually price um, a, a Facebook campaign, you basically have to build your own matrix of demographic testing and hit the API as many times as you can to get a pricing landscape from them. There's essentially, or literally go in by hand and start like typing in, you know, vampires and, you know, hunger games and see what that shows you, right? Um, so how, how are your teams coping with that? And I mean this from an expectation setting perspective. I think one of the things is we're all very familiar how to go in and set expectations well on a search campaign, or at least frame the landscape pretty well. We've seen just a massive variance in outcomes in Facebook, um, and we've worked pretty hard to build our own in-house tools on that, but how are you dealing with that? Well, you know, in search, you know, search itself, when you start a campaign, you have fresh information, and, you know, where do you go to rely upon it? I mean, now the technology's there. Um, I think it's something that we'll get there as well, the technology here in this space. Um, but what we're doing right now is it, we're, we're going out there, and we're seeing just what that volume looks like. The, the daily kind of growth and really what we can expect and then set the right expectations from there. Um, and you know, generally we, we start with modest budgets and then work into it, just like we do with a lot of search campaigns. And I think, yeah. you know, there's that, and that's why there's such a great correlation between the two. Yeah, and I will say, you know, we do have, you know, we do have clients now coming to us, or at least I do, you have clients coming to me saying, you know, I really want to be in Facebook, I'm gonna give you a million dollars this year to run in Facebook, and it's like, well, 
given what you do and what you offer, I'm not sure, you know, if that's going to be the best, you know, the best approach or if that I'm going to be able to do that for you. But, you know, let's let's price it out. Let's figure it out. Let's figure out what the KPIs are and, wh and exactly what you want to extract from this, given the limitations that social can have. Um, you know, let's let's work on this. But, you know, so I think for us on the agency side, we have a lot of clients who want to be on Facebook and they come to us and they say, you know, at least for me, I have this kind of a budget or I want to take this percentage of the overall investment and put it into Facebook, whether it be premium or whether it be um, marketplace and you know let's you know tell me is this the right approach and you know what what do you guys think of this budget number and you know we're seeing clients wanting to throw a lot more money into Facebook overall and it's them coming to us and saying I want to spend this much and I don't know if that's just ego and they say you know I want to be one of the top spenders in Facebook I want to be all over that play all over the place but um, but yeah it's it's been a very interesting and aggressive um, approach in the last year I'd say with clients when you have clients that big demanding it yeah. you're gonna have technology coming to provide it yeah and it's funny I think um, what I've seen is the number one justification for spending money on Facebook is my competitor has more fans than yeah. I have it's we call it fan yeah. envy and trust me we sell against it <laughs> right it's it's a wonderful way to get budgets um, but you know for all we know um, that's a good activity to do to acquire fans if you have a back end You'll appreciate this. We have a customer that we work with that it boggles my mind. They're willing to pay $2 for a like. I'm like, how did you get there? $2 a like. I don't know. They must have pulled it out of the hat somewhere, but think about that for a minute, right? This is a major player, major marketer looking to pay $2 a like. I was staggering and they have no idea what they're going to do with them. I think that actually brings up a really good point. You know. What is, is $2 like good for some and not for others? Like entertainment, forget it. $2 like you're just, you're, you know, you're just, you're, that money's going, money's going somewhere. Um, and it's not going into Facebook. Um, but I think it's, it's also understanding those benchmarks and knowing that, you know, uh, like we have, you know, feminine hygiene products, you're not gonna get the click-through rates and those CPCs are just gonna be through the roof. So $2 is a high, I think in general, but not so bad compared to like uh, for some entertainment and a Twilight launch. I mean, people are liking that left and right, whether you do anything or not. So I think it's understanding that, setting the right benchmarks, and really getting the technology providers and really the industry helping to define what those right kind of expectations are so that we can at least say, this is how we should expect to uh, perform instead of clients saying, $2 a like, here's an X amount, get this number of likes and I'm happy because we need to be smarter than that. Well, we need to be guiding them yeah. and, and educating them. And and that was a little bit of my point. It's hard to guide and educate someone when you can't get any data on how to guide and educate <laughs> right. them, right? I mean, I think as an industry, we all become smarter over time, and we can share that information and data. You know, you know rule of thumb, click through, I mean, uh, conversion rates and search now by industry, there's just enough data out there. But I think it's very hard um, on the social side to give anybody an idea of scope or scale or, you know, um, or, or cost of like, I mean, for most of our customers, we see about a dollar to two dollars, you know, per like, and they're thrilled with that. Right. That's right. Um, yeah. I mean, then that's a pretty broad industry set. So, um, so we are, are wrapping down, um, and we're going to take a couple questions. Um, maybe I'll steal uh, Marty's idea and say, you know, one uh, one giveaway um, that you've experienced on the social side um, that is uh, that you think would be really valuable for for the audience. You know, one thing that I, you know, I'm out there, I'm on the sales side, and I'm talking to a lot of customers, you know, selling what we sell at Extol, but the conversation, I two things that are really uh, coming to the forefront in the past six months uh, is connecting the, the e-commerce and business KPIs to their social strategies. And that's also the senior marketing people saying that they're getting pressure now from the CFO where they've been doing experimentation, building fan pages, building likes, Twitter, and so forth, adding to staff and overhead, and they got a couple million dollar budget. Now they're going back for more, and the CFO's going, okay, you know, where is it? You know, where's the money? What can I expect? And they're struggling with how to budget and forecast. That's what I really see. And then also that, I think, links them back to the e-commerce, because they're looking for a hook to get some metrics on business and sales. I think from, from a Facebook perspective, uh, a lot of companies fail to focus on the actual publishing metrics. So everybody's very 
very focused on, you know, how did this object of content perform, or how is this advertising perform, what's it doing for my ROI, but they're not looking at, you know, how many times a day am I actually publishing, you know, what's the average shelf life of those, those status updates, are they going in the right places, um, you know, are, they, are there certain benchmarks that, whether it's the agency or whether it's the internal team, are they hitting those benchmarks on a daily, weekly basis? You go into Insights or any of the other third-party tools, a lot of times you'll see in a, in a corporate brand, publishing Monday through Friday and then Saturday and Sunday, there's nothing. So really focusing on first, how are we gonna produce enough content and make sure it's the right content that then kind of drives all the other results that we're looking for. That's where I feel like companies of all sizes should be focusing right now. Well, mine isn't necessarily related to Facebook. I mean, mine's more of a social media optimization tactic giveaway. Um, <laughs> Just hearkening back to the uh, the last panel and, and conversation and stuff in terms of optimizing tweets, um, you know, one thing that we've um, we've learned over the last year and, and encouraging clients to do when they're optimizing their social media when it comes to tweets, make sure you are dumping whatever targeted keyword or phrase that you want to approach. Make sure you dump it within the first few characters of the tweet. Um, you know, uh, what we're really doing, in, you know, on a regular basis, and where we're finding, you know. Uh, that there are a lot of technology partners out there that are that are willing to be very flexible and really create their product for what you need. Because right now we are in that time of we're needed to wrap. I mean, we're getting the pressure from clients, and we ourselves are providing the pressure on ourselves to to perform better and get into the data and understand what that means. Um, but also to write down the tools to enable us to do that. Uh, so what we're doing and where we're finding success is we're pressing uh, the different providers that we're looking at and making sure that we're keeping them honest, um, being very transparent with those that may have existed in a managed service kind of uh, offering before and, and transitioning them and making, that, making them understand a little bit the longer term opportunities for us and them uh, ad you know, adapting their product for our needs. So I think it's making sure that you're challenging these, these partners that you're working with um, and then the technology to enable you to do a lot of things that we're talking about because uh, without that technology there, it's gonna be very difficult to, to get wrap your arms, arms around it. Uh, one uh, one uh, thing that I'll give away is uh, for those of you that are familiar or not familiar with um, Facebook's algorithm, they have something called Edge Rank, which basically decides what content goes to what people. And um, like all algorithms, there are things about it you can take advantage of. One of them is um, going a little bit to what Nate was talking about, being very thoughtful about your content strategy, ordering, etc. When you get a content post on your page that gets uh, liked or commented or shared, basically has a lot of engagement, effectively. Facebook in EdRank gives you a higher quality score, if you want to think about it in Google terms, and they will bump your distribution of the next post that you put into the queue. So you, we have this thing called commercial bumping where you basically put a cat video or unicorns or something like that uh, on your Facebook page, which gets a lot of distribution, and then you throw a highly commercial or product-oriented post behind it. And you can actually increase your reach like six to seven percent um, just by thinking about you know, basically tailing off of a post that gets a lot of engagement. That's how they think about the distribution of your posts. If you're getting heavy engagement, they give you more. So rather than just putting out six cat videos in a row, you're really wasting those slots to tail off of the ones that are um, very effective for you. So um, if you're only doing you know, uh, four to six posts a week, you, you, know, you can actually be quite thoughtful about how you do that. So, so that's similar to a you know, quality score and impression versus click and you know, not wanting to overload. Um, a bunch of impressions out there from a paid search perspective, so it's interesting. Can I can I share another trick on that? Sure, we gotta so take a question. There with that, that with that content stuff, um, when you're sharing those updates, you you always want to think about leading the fans too. So prefacing an update of by a show of likes. Now you want to be careful that it's not a voting mechanism so you don't go against the TNC or even uh, we've had a lot of success with this or that questions. Give a fan two options. Do you like this or do you like that? And you'll just see this tremendous increase in the terms of comments and engagement and it happens very quickly. Yeah, There's actually a great study by um, uh, by Buddy Media that they just put out where they did a huge amount of content analysis. The optimal number of characters per post per industry optimal time of day, optimal day of the week, optimal question type um, or sort of post type, uh, very, in, very instructive if you're just starting to get a um, feeling for how to approach content. So, uh, okay, I, we have to take a couple of questions if we have them. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> My name's Tony. Um, uh, I, I like this topic um, and what I'm from hearing from the panel um, are a lot of the same challenges I hear from my clients and I've heard in other panels. What, um, one of the topics I, I rarely hear is uh, the, 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 how eerily similar some of these challenges are to DR challenges from 15 years ago. 
So uh, the, the equity or currency of a like um, is, is very similar to, you know, doing a, a, a mailer for a sweepstakes in, in the late 90s and, and what are the values uh, of, of the uh, clients coming to our database. Um, and I also hear likes, uh, typically, I promise there's a question in our future. Um, I also hear likes uh, referred to sort of as that snapshot in time of when somebody becomes a like, as opposed to what is the source of that like, um, how did they come into our database, and what is their behavior afterwards. So the question, um, to what extent are you applying traditional media sensibilities and methodologies to uh, uh, both the acquisition and the measurement of uh, the acquiring likes? Well, the, 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 in terms of acquisition, I mean, one of the things that, that I've seen in past roles is, is really, and, and again, you can't really do light gating that well anymore, um, but really customizing the experience from ad all the way through like, whether it's a like on an ad or something, to a customized tab. Um, and really trying to match that experience up so it's seamless all the way through. If you're delivering an, an ad that's relevant to moms between the ages of 24 and 36, and when they land on the page, there's a tab, and maybe now it's a pin directing them up to a tab that has specific information for that, that's usually going to garner a lot more attention and, and likes. Um, in terms of measuring that, you know, that's, that's all changed in the last six to 12 months, I think. Yeah, I would say that, you know, in terms of, you know, because I work within an agency where there is still a very heavy focus on traditional media, we are being compared to the delivery or the GRPs in those other areas and being, um, being compared to the efficient, you know, having search, social, display, everything compared to the efficiency in those other areas. And, you know, there is, with our client base, with some of them, there is still a very large hold on, um, on utilizing those traditional metrics or that traditional ideology in terms of measuring the value of it. And, and it's a constant challenge. And again, it goes back to the education of, of making sure that we're educating the client and setting those, you know, whether it be you know, a 101 on digital across the board or specific digital 101s within each discipline, really educating them on what the return or what the expectation should be and how they should actually be looking and measuring to it. Um, because yeah, again, we do have a lot of clients where it is very, I don't wanna say old school thinking, but it is very traditional thinking and we're having to sync up to it and marry it. The tide is changing. Um, we have seen some clients where digital is taking more of the lead and the focus and the client on its side has uh, more digitally savvy folks running it, um, but there still is that challenge there and it's, it, it comes down to a constant education with the client. Right. I, I think we need to, uh wrap up. So I'll just sort of cap that and say, if you're getting into social, um, one of the big differences is that you need to sell social as well as whatever product or service you're selling. In search, none of us sell search. We sell the solution that we have in search. And uh, I think that's a big change for a lot of organizations that have a sales force and an organization designed to sell into a mature market. So just something to think about. Great. Join me in thanking uh, Neil and all the panelists.